Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Elaine Wu, and I'm one of the principal counsels or directors of the China team of IP experts here at the USPTO's Office of Policy and International Affairs. I would like to welcome everyone to this webinar on bioformat patents in China, litigation licensing and patent linkage. According to industry sources, China is the world's second largest biopharmaceutical market and continues to grow at a fast pace, particularly as the country's growing wealth and rapidly aging population creates strong demand for healthcare products in an increasing number of diseases, including cancers, cardiovascular diseases, and diabetes. The increase of China's bio, Chinese biopharma companies uh, reflects the industry's growth and potential, and why company formation declined in other major markets, more than 140 new biotech companies emerged in China from 2010 to 2020. In recognizing this potential, China's policymakers have embarked on a mission to advance the industry by enacting policies uh, explicitly to improve uh, the industry. This morning, we'll be talking about the new IP laws and regulations that China has recently enacted as part of this overall effort, and also as part of its obligations to implement the U.S.-China Economic and Trade Agreement, or the Phase 1 Agreement, that both, both countries entered into two years ago. Let me go ahead and introduce the speakers to the program. Our first speaker today is Larry Lian, a patent attorney with many years' experience and expertise in the biopharma industry. He is part of the USPTO's China team of IP experts. The Chinese team of I, China team of IP experts here at the PTO consists of a dedicated group of China IP experts with 11 U.S.-based lawyers, three IP attaches in our offices in Beijing, Guangzhou, and Shanghai, and five China-based U.S. lawyers. Uh, excuse me, five China-based lawyers. All of our lawyers have a very good deal of expertise in China IP law, as well as U.S. law. One of our important missions is to help improve the IP environment in China and also in the U.S. for the benefit of our companies, whether they are looking to export to China or to partner in some way with Chinese firms or dealing with Chinese-made counterfeits entering the U.S. or other markets. Our next speaker is Jonathan Miao. He is with NTD IP Attorneys and Partners in the Beijing office. Jonathan joined NTD in 2003 and has extensive expertise and experience in patent-related contentious matters. He is now leading a team of specialized in providing legal services in the fields of chemistry and biotech. Jill Gu is with the Shanghai office of Allen & Overy and is our next speaker. She is, this is a UK-based multinational law firm. Uh, she has extensive experience in patents and trade secret matters and routinely advises clients in the area of life sciences. Linson Hoffman is a founding partner in Liu Zheng, Chen, and Hoffman. Uh, Dr. Lin Hoffman uh, is a patent attorney with 20 years experience focused on innovative life sciences. She has deep knowledge of all aspects of patent practice, ranging from policy, patent pr prep and prosecution, due diligence, opinion work, and of course, licensing and technology transfer negotiations. Each speaker will speak about 10 minutes, after which we will have moderated panel discussion. We will have Q&A period after the discussion. Please ask questions using the email box, askchinaip at uspto.gov. Again, askchinaip at uspto.gov. Before we start, I also wanted to give you an idea of the audience that registered for the program. Uh, we asked on a volunteer basis for you to take a short survey with us. I want to quickly go through some of the results of the survey to give you a flavor of those who are attending today. While a small number of you took the survey, this does offer a snapshot of the audience. We first asked the size of the company with which you are affiliated. 61% responded that the size of 1,000 employees are over. 22% of those who answered said they were from companies between 1 and 50, with the remainder from uh, uh, companies a little larger than that, but under 1,000 employees. The second question asked what your primary lines of business in China were. 55% of those respondents said that they manufactured outside China for import and sale in China, and 33% are manufacturing in China for sale in China. 16% are manufacturing inside China for export outside China. The third question asked what the primary IP concerns are that your company faces. The biggest challenges faced by companies are patent-related challenges, followed by concerns regarding IP enforcement. Other prevalent problems include Chinese government pressures to transfer technology to Chinese entities, Chinese government interferences with IP licensing, and concerns about protecting and enforcing trade secrets. We've asked companies to tell us whether over the course of the last five years there was any change in the IP situation in China. 
53% of those respondents said there was a noticeable improvement in the enactment of laws that address concerns of rights holders. Regarding enforcement, 25% said there was improvement, but 75% said there was no change. With regard to obstacles to IP licensing, 12% said there was an improvement, 12% said the situation had gotten worse, and 75% said there was no change. Regarding pressures from the government to transfer technology, 89% said there was no change. Finally, with regard to unauthorized disclosure infringement stemming from regulatory or other government processes, 11% said there was an improvement, but 89% said there was no change. With that, let's go ahead and start the program. One last thing, there will be a post-program survey. Please click, click onto the link to take a survey. We would very much appreciate it if you do so, so we can continually improve our webinars. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Larry, who will give a general overview of some of the changes we have seen recently in patent-related law, uh, laws uh, and regulations that deal with biopharma, the biopharma area. Over to you, Larry. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Elaine. So just to uh, to give you guys the a uh, sense of the uh, scale, in the past, I believe uh, a year and uh, three months. There were, I don't uh, remember the exact number uh, already, I think 60 or 80 uh, amended uh, laws or regulations that uh, came out from uh, China. So at least a lot has been happening on paper. And hopefully uh, today through the speakers, uh, Jill, Jonathan, and Lynn, you can get a sense uh, the some of the early facts of these legislations uh, on the ground. Uh, of course, we only have a very limited uh, uh, time today to cover very uh, cover just selected topics, but uh, let let me try to broaden a bit uh, to uh, cover a few just a few topics that uh, we don't have uh, time to uh, go through in more detail. Uh, before I do that, I want to quickly mention something about patent linkage. You may have uh, heard the uh, patent linkage being referred to as early dispute resolution system. I think that's the uh, phrase actually uh, used in, in uh, phase one agreement between US and China. That may be a more precise name, even though it's kind of a mouthful to, to say. And uh, just the, it's more precise because that's kind of uh, uh, spelled out what exactly the link patent linkage system is. It provides a uh, certainty uh, with the early dispute resolution. You, you resolve the dispute uh, before the uh, generic goes to the market, uh, that that uh, early uh, that certainty, for lack of a better way to describe it, I always try to tell people who perhaps don't know the linkage system very well, it's a way of avoiding the uh, patentee and uh, generic or biosimilar applic uh, applicant uh, playing Russian roulette. In that sense, it's kind of a win-win system. Is uh, of course how exactly you implement it is still. Uh, important, but uh, but fundamentally the concept in my mind is always uh, sort of a win-win uh, design. So with that, let me let me uh, move on to a few topics that, that I think our uh, speakers probably don't have a whole lot of time to cover. The first one is the patent extension, uh, patent, uh, sorry, patent term extension. Uh, you may hear that as sort of patent term compensation uh, or even sometimes patent term uh, adjustment. But uh, in the US law, at least, patent term extension uh, refers to the uh, compensation of patent term due to marketing approval delay. In other words, you got your patent, but you cannot uh, commercialize your patent because you got to get approval uh, whenever the product uh, is sort of a medicine or, or even medical device that uh, involves uh, human health. Uh, I just want to quickly point out, uh, uh, many of you may be aware, actually, the uh, during the draft law process, the uh, patent term extension, which is uh, compensating the uh, uh, regulatory approval delay or marketing approval delay, and also patent term adjustment, which is compensating for patent office delay, in the uh, draft law process for both the uh, a patent law amendment, the draft patent law amendment rather, actually said may compensate, may compensate for regulatory delay, may compensate for uh, patent office delay. But uh, the uh, final uh, patent law, which came into effect, I believe, June 1st uh, last year, 
uh, for pan term extension and the pan term uh, adjustment both have the word shell. So that's that's a very good uh, welcome change from the final law compared with the uh, draft law. Uh, the pan term adjustment for, of course, pan, uh, for pan office delay, that, that one is not limited to uh, to uh, biopharma patents. That's all patents. The pan, pan term extension is limited to uh, those patents that requires uh, uh, a marketing approval. Uh, in addition to uh, pan law amendment, and uh, various measures, the uh, there's uh, I think several SPC JI judicial interpretations uh, also came out. Uh, in addition, uh, CIPA also amended its uh, examination guidelines. Uh, in that uh, examination guideline amendment, I want to highlight a uh, rule that is particularly critical to the uh, innovative uh, biopharma companies, and that relates to uh, the patent, uh, patentee's ability to uh, file post-filing supplemental data to prove inventive step or sufficiency of uh, enablement. And I believe uh, this may be 20, as late as 2013 or so, uh, China categorically, uh, categorically desire, um, uh, reject supplemental data. If the uh, data is not in your application, sorry, you're out of luck. And that has changed quite a bit. I think Jonathan and uh, Elaine will have uh, time to get into a little bit more detail uh, with regard to the uh, supplemental data rule. Uh, I want to also uh, quickly mention something that is not limited to the biopharma industry. That is the so-called abnormal applications. And by CIPA's announcement, announcement uh, I think the total number CIP, CIPA mentioned uh, the uh, number of uh, abnormal applications is 80, uh, 815,000. That's quite a bit for, for year 2021. Uh, I think that uh, by my calculation, uh, about uh, that's about 15 to 20% of the uh, total amount of applications uh, CIPA receives, and th that's uh, quite a bit. And the word abnormal, of course, you might ask because it doesn't exist uh, in the US system. What do you mean by abnormal? And there's uh, actually quite extensive definitions, but uh, the gist of it is that uh, the application is not submitted for the, uh, for the purpose of uh, securing uh, protection of, uh, of an invention. I think uh, uh, you may never see this in CIP announcement, but, it, but I think it's fair to say it's pretty much applications submitted for the uh, sole purpose of uh, getting subsidy. And in that regard, the uh, uh, CIP actually announced the uh, subsidies. They will eliminate all subsidies by 2025, and all the provincial and the local IP offices are, men, uh, are required, I believe, to reduce their subsidy like by 25% every year towards the uh, total elimination by uh, 2025, and uh, as recent as uh, just last month, January 27th, I believe, CIPA also announced a measure that included some more details on how uh, they will punish applicants who uh, violate the good faith in IP field, for which abnormal application is a big part. The bad faith trademark application is, uh, is another big part of that uh, violation of uh, good faith. And I, I actually see a welcome, uh, a welcome step, uh, a good step actually uh, in that announcement uh, because the announcement said uh, with regard to uh, uh, either abnormal application or violation of uh, good faith in IP field, uh, which is uh, concealing important facts. Uh, for a long time, actually, the uh, rights holders uh, have been pushing, have been uh, telling us that uh, concealing prior art is kind of the uh, ultimate cause of uh, abnormal applications. Uh, I think uh, concealing important facts is it's kind is a welcome uh, step forward. Of course, it's still not exactly uh, concealing prior art. And with that, I think sorry, I aim to like take seven or eight minutes. I think I already overrun my time. Let me just uh, stop there and welcome any uh, questions through the email box. Uh, let me turn the uh, floor to, uh, actually, who's going to go after me? Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan, all right. Yeah. Go ahead, Jonathan. 
Okay, thank you, Larry. Yeah. So this is not my slides. Uh, since here, can you change it to my slides? My slides is uh, bioformer pattern prosecution and litigation, not this one. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Since I have only ten minutes, the lights are calm. Get to the point. Uh, firstly, I want to show you some recent data about the pattern of filings in China. Uh, as Larry mentioned, uh, in recent years, every year China has a huge amount of patent filings. Uh, in the year of 2020, China again ranked number one uh, in the in the major major uh, economies. And uh, uh, as to the field of bioformer, uh, we can also see that uh, China still has uh, the largest number of patent filings. And since the year of uh, 2013. Uh, China is uh, surpassing U.S. Uh, at uh, accelerated speed, and as of uh, uh, October last year, China has uh, more than half of the patents in the field of of uh, biopharma. Uh, instead of the increased uh, uh, amount of patent filing every year, uh, as Larry mentioned, that uh, in recent years the CNIPA is uh, taking uh, initiatives to to uh, to improve their examination efficiency and also to improve the quality of China patents. Uh, last year, in October last year, the director of CNIPA announced that they are now able to reduce the average time needed for, for invention patent examination to about 19 months. Yeah, that's pretty fast. Uh, and in the meanwhile, uh, we can see that there is a steady decrease of the grant rate of invention patent in China, which I think indicates uh, uh, improvement of the patent quality in China and, uh, and, uh, and the decrease of the so-called garbage patent application or abnormal patent application. So having said that, with uh, the huge number of uh, patent applications uh, in bioformer field, and with uh, uh, increased improvement of examination uh, efficiency and uh, improvement of uh, patent quality in China, I think China for those uh, who are players and innovators in bioformer field, China is becoming more and more uh, important and attractive. Uh, not only because China is uh, towarding uh, a so-called aiding society, but also because China is uh, now uh, becoming more and more friendly to innovators, in, especially in the bioformer field. Uh, so having talked about this, uh, this, uh, this data, uh, firstly, I want to give the audience a brief introduction to the patent prosecution and the patent litigation, patent infringement litigation in China, with a focus on the difference between China and the U.S. Uh, so as to patent prosecution, I think there are uh, uh, many, uh, the, the difference lies in three, three aspects. The first aspect is uh, in China and the U.S., although we both have the grace period requirements, but in China we have only uh, the six months grace period. And also the grace period exemptions are uh, strictly limited to four scenarios. And the first scenario, the disclosure uh, for the first time for the purpose of the public interest was introduced uh, uh, with the amendment, uh, the fourth amendment to the Chinese patent law. Uh, and uh, to my knowledge in US, you can have uh, a novelty grace period of up to one year and almost no restriction to the manner of disclosure. So as to grace period, I think uh, in US, you have more lenient grace period requirement. And secondly, um, uh, as to the post filing data uh, regarding the, the formality and the content requirements for the post filing data, I think the U.S. has uh, also a more lenient and open attitude toward post filing data compared with the practice in China. Uh, but of course, after the phase one uh, China and U.S. Uh, agreement, now we have already have some very significant and uh, observable uh, improvement in the attitude toward post filing data. 
And the third aspect uh, regarding the difference between China and U.S. is uh, is uh, what can be what can be protected, what can be claimed. Uh, regarding the biopharma field, uh, I think we have uh, substances, including antibodies, vaccines, and compositions. All these substances uh, can also be patent patented in China. I think the same in U.S. Uh, so in general, uh, the the method for diagnosis uh, or, or or method for the treatment of a disease. Uh, are not patentable in China for humanitarianism considerations. Uh, for similar reasons, uh, drug administration uh, methods, including uh, the dosage, uh, interval between dosing, and the roads of administration, those are not patentable in China. Uh, but there is something uh, uh, deserves uh, uh, deserves a further mention, that is for the second use. The second use of a known drug uh, for second use of a known drug, uh, if you claim it as a method for, for treatment of disease, of course, that is not patentable, but you can draft it in a manner of so-called Swiss style, and uh, with that, you can obtain a patent protection in China. Uh, before I uh, we move uh, to the patent infringement litigation, I want to talk about the uh, patent related court system in China. And uh, in China, for the patent infringement litigation and uh, the patent validity litigation, uh, we have the so called bifurcated systems. Uh, that means the patent infringement case and the patent validity case, they go through different court systems. For patent infringement litigation, we have the so called one plus four plus n system. So at the Supreme Court level or the Appellate Court level, we have an IP tribunal uh, inside the Supreme Court, which is a specialist in hearing IP cases, especially cases involving technical issues, including the patent disputes. Yeah. And then at the trial stage, we have, uh, we have four specialized IP, IP courts. Uh, which uh, respectively located in Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, and Hainan. And we also have uh, 24 uh, IP tribunals in different uh, provinces and uh, which, can, which can hear cases uh, uh, across their traditional jurisdiction. So with such a, such a design of court system for patent infringement cases, uh, we are now having a kind of a concentrated jurisdiction, which can help to uniform the criteria for, for case judgment, and also can, uh, to some extent, avoid uh, the so-called uh, uh, local protectionism. And then uh, as to the patent invalidation cases, they go through uh, a, a different, uh, a different uh, approach or a different route of court system. So for patent invalidation cases, they always start from the CNIPA, the Chinese Patent Office, uh, start, starting from the CNIPA invalidation proceeding, which is uh, uh, administrative proceeding. So if one party is not satisfied with the decision made by CNIPA regarding the validity of the patent, that party can, uh, can bring uh, a judicial review case before Beijing IP court. So for this kind of case, actually Beijing IP court is a, is a trial stage, is a trial stage, although it is a second stage. And then uh, after the Beijing IP court, we still have uh, uh, the parties still have opportunity for for a pallet for a pallet stage, uh, which is at the uh, at the IP tribunal of the Supreme Court, where uh, the, the the party can get the final the final judgment the final judgment, and uh, now you can see. For both the patent invalidation case and the patent infringement case, at the appellate stage, they converge to the same IP tribunal. That is the IP tribunal in the Supreme Court. Uh, so this on this slide, I show some of the major difference between uh, as to patent infringement litigation between China and the US. 
In US, you have the very powerful and efficient discovery process for evidence collection. In China, we don't have that. In US, you have the jury. Uh, in China, we have something uh, that may be, may, be, uh, may be similar, but quite different, which is the people's juror. But the people's juror, actually, they sit together with the judge. They form a, a, they form a, a panel together with the judge to hear the case and make the decision. Uh, and also in US, you have the Markman hearing. In China, we don't have that. And also for the, uh, for the process in China, generally for infringement litigation, it takes relatively shorter time. You can get a judgment relatively quicker. Uh, and also as to the possibility of getting injunction uh, in China, almost in each and every infringement case, so long as the patent infringement is established and approved, you can almost always get uh, injunction order. Uh, but as to the damage compensation, uh, as you may have seen from previous reports, uh, the patent comp uh, monetary compensation award in China is relatively low compared to that the patent get in the US side. But in recent years, we have seen a steady increase of the monetary compensation in China. Uh, another thing is about the evidence used in the patent infringement litigation. Uh, in US, I think uh, the affidavits and the depositions are widely used and uh, witness are, are also widely used in the court proceeding. But in China, although we also have this kind of evidence also acceptable in a court proceeding, but generally we tend to think that this kind of evidence uh, uh, has relatively lower probative value compared with uh, documentary evidence. Or in other words, in a legal proceeding in China, documentary evidence always bears a higher probative value. So having briefly talked about the Chinese practice in patent prosecution and patent litigation, I want to uh, introduce a recent case that handled by myself. And with this case, we can see how, how the, the proceeding works and how uh, we can share some detailed uh, takeaway take points with our audience. Uh, in this case, our client, the red holder, uh, the, it is not a patentee, it is a licensee of a Chinese patent uh, which protect uh, a novel cellulase, which is an uh, enzyme for, for, for cellulose treatment. It can help, it can be used for, for washing use or for fabric processing. It can reduce the force on our clothes, especially uh, sweaters. Uh, so there is one in, uh, infringer uh, who was producing uh, the same product with exactly the same bio sequence and the infringer was actively selling the product but at a much, much lower price. And uh, with, with that, the infringer grabbed almost all the market share of our, our client, the, the red holder or the licensee. So, on the, on the picture, these are the product we, uh, we seized, we, we, we purchased from this infringer. And you can see the label on the, on the, bot, on the barrels. And these labels are, uh, are, <clears throat> are covered by, by not Republic in China. So in China, as I mentioned, we have a relatively stricter requirement on the formality of evidence. So, so to, to purchase the product and get the purchase the product notarized is always the most important step in the evidence fixation uh, of our invalidation, uh, infringement litigation case. <clears throat> So uh, always before, uh, so before initiating the lawsuit, there is a long, uh, we will spend a long time to prepare the case from uh, identifying the infringement and align with the client team uh, to about the goals of the enforcement actions. 
and uh, to assess uh, the possibility of infringement related with the patent, the patents. And more importantly, we spend a long time to collect evidence to conduct the, the notarized purchase and to collect uh, evidence about the production scale, uh, collect uh, their environment in, uh, impact assessment and a lot of evidence. So once we have all the evidence uh, ready, we, we start talking about the, the infringer to see whether there is a possibility to settle this case so that both parties can, can, can resolve this, uh, this dispute in a more efficient way. So in this case, the infringer, they are quite stubborn. They didn't uh, even acknowledge their uh, infringement activity. So then we decided to initiate the lawsuit and uh, so generally, once you initiate the lawsuit and both parties, uh, we file our evidence to show the infringement and uh, uh, evidence to support our damage claim. And the other party will file counter evidence. Then the court will organize uh, evidence exchange and the both party will see the evidence submitted by the early par other party and to check the, the authenticity, credibility and uh, other, other requirements. Uh, other requirement on the on the evidence, and then we will have the pre-trial conference. On such conference, the judge will uh, will review evidence submitted by both parties and uh, hear uh, opinions uh, from both parties and to figure out what is uh, the uh, focus of dispute between parties. Uh, in our case, uh, since uh, both parties has a significant uh, apparent dispute on the infringement assessment, and we assert there is an infringement, the other party, they said their product is different from uh, what is claimed in our claims. So uh, the, the judge decided to, to use uh, independent judicial appraisal institution and arrange a separate test, a separate test and uh, the, 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 the conclusion of the test that showed that uh, their biosequence is exactly the same as, claim, as claimed in our claim. Uh, then after, that, after receiving the judicial appraisal report, the judge arranged, uh, I think, two additional court hearings. Firstly, to review the judicial report, hear opinions of both parties on the judicial report and uh, the infringement assessment, and also here uh, uh, review the evidence about uh, monetary compensation. Uh, then last year, we received the judgment, yeah. So in this judgment, uh, uh, the, uh, we, we received the injunction order and uh, uh, the judge issued the injunction uh, against uh, all the products, all the infringing products. And also we, uh, our client was awarded uh, uh, monetary compensation of uh, 10 million RMB. Uh, that was the highest record in the field of, uh, uh, at least in Anzam, or at least in Anzam, yeah. Uh, uh, and also in this case, uh, in this uh, amount of uh, monetary compensation, part of them are awarded for uh, as a punitive compensation, fivefold of punitive compensation, because uh, during the proceeding of our court hearing, the fourth amendment of, of Chinese patent law uh, came into force, and so for some part of the compensation. Uh, we 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 satisfy the conditions for for punitive compensation. Yeah, and uh, what makes us very happy is in this case uh, the judge also award uh, award a compensation for attorney fee of one million RMB. That's a, that's a pretty high amount compared with uh, previous cases. So uh, as a takeaway point from from uh, from this case, uh, so firstly, uh, I want to uh, send a message to our audience now in China for willful infringement. We have a punitive compensation, which can be as high as uh, five times of the damage to 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 the patentee or to the right holder. Uh, the second one is, uh, I think this is something unique in the patent infringement case uh, in China, which is a judicial appraisal when both parties have uh, 
uh, dispute on the infringement assessment, the judge will will elect a judicial a independent judicial appraisal institution to determine to to run test to determine whether there is a patent infringement. Uh, the third one is about the shift of burden of proof in China. Uh, I think uh, we we may talk about this later if we have time in the Q and A session. Uh, and in this case. Uh, uh, one, uh, since we have already proved that there is a clear infringement, then as to the monetary compensation, since we as the patentee, we don't have evidence to show uh, how much is uh, the exact profit uh, of the of the infringer, and then we request uh, for shift the part of the burden of proof to the other party, ask them to produce their financial book and their sales contract. The judge did so. And uh, and uh, also made the co uh, judgment on monetary compensation according to the evidence collected. Uh, the first point is uh, about the licensee's right to sue the infringer. In this case, uh, our our client is a, a, a common or a normal a ordinary licensee. It's not a sole licensee. So for uh, for ordinary licensee, in order to have the right to to sue the infringer, I need to firstly have authorization from the from the patentee. Uh, besides that, uh, the the licensee also need to have a, a declaration from the patentee declaring that the, the patentee abandoned its own right to seal the infringer. So that's all I want to share with you. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, we'll go ahead to our next speaker who will be talking about patent linkage. Jill, thank you. Thanks, Elaine. Um, as Larry, alluded to earlier, one of the most significant developments in China regarding patents will be patent linkage. And before we dive into that, it may be worthwhile explaining what is linkage. Linkage means that the regulatory approval of a generic drug is linked to the resolution of patent dispute between an innovator and a generic. You may have already thought that this is very much like the US system, the Hatch-Waxman system. You are right. Uh, China borrowed that from the U.S. And to make it work, first we need to have the patent listings submitted by innovators. There will also need to be generic certifications filed by generic when they submitted their generic drug applications. Most importantly, there needs to be a mechanism for the parties to resolve disputes with the regulatory approval for the generic being stayed for a certain period. So in principle, we have this all in place, but it's now the system and it's up and running. But to reach to this point, it took quite some years. And you may have heard that US made this in the phase one deal and China committed to establish this resolution system for patent disputes between innovators and generics. But within China, this took several years in the making and understanding that will help you better understand the system in China. So importantly, patent linkage system touches on two policy imperatives, which underscores the ongoing healthcare reform in China. On one hand, the government really wanted to speed up access to innovative drugs and at the same time, an even more or grand, grand drive here will be to push down the sky high drug price in China. And that means the generic entry in China. So patent linkage system touches on both prongs. The fourth amendment of the patent law brought to life the patent linkage system in China. The fourth amendment of the patent law uh, was enacted last year. So fast forward to today, where things stand now. First of all, a new cause of action for patent linkage has been created under Article 76 of the PRC patent law. And the Supreme Court in China has issued a judicial interpretation concerning the litigation for patent linkage. And both the patent and the drug authorities in China, CNIPA and ANPA, have also weighed in issuing their implementing rules 
regarding the working of the system. So for example, you have Paragraph 4 certifications in the US and in China, we call it Type 4 certification. And this means that a generic states that the, its specific, specific solutions does not fall within the scope of patents or the innovator's patent is otherwise invalid. And the system has been up and running for quite some time, for more than six months. And if you go on to NNPA's website, over a thousand generic certifications have been filed and published. So next, now look, let's look at Article 76, because that is the heart and the center of the patent linkage system. In China, the concept of artificial infr infringement is not adopted. Instead, a new cause of action has been created, and that is called the scope confirmation action. This is essentially to determine whether a generic technical solution falls within the scope of an innovator's patent. And under the law, interestingly, both an innovator and a generic may request a declaratory determination and who has jurisdiction, this is even making things more interesting and trickier. Both the Beijing IP Court as the judiciary and the CNIPA as the administrative agency now are having concurrent jurisdiction to hear Article 76 cases. This really adds to the complications, which I hope I'll have time to explain a bit more here. And according to Article 76, the filing of a patent linkage case by the innovator will stay the generic approval. And that stay period has been stipulated to be a nine month period. So what are the highlights of the patent linkage system? As you will imagine, there will be obligations, affirmative obligations that need to be undertaken by both innovators and generic companies for them to avail the benefits and incentives under the new system. But very, very importantly here, although the stay period is short, that's only a nine month period compared to the US 30 month period, an innovator must pull the trigger, otherwise it will waive the nine month regulatory stay in order to slow the generic entry. The most challenging thing I think innovator companies now face in China is to determine where with which forum they wanted to file their case. Should it be filed with the CNIPA, the administrative agency, or with the Beijing IP court? Or is there a solution in terms of preserving flexibility by filing two cases? And the fundamental issue, I think, also ties to what Jonathan explained to you earlier, because in China, patent litigation is bifurcated. Validity is dealt with separately. So validity is very, very important here. And now a big controversy and ongoing debate is whether a decision handed down by CNIPA that can still be appealed can terminate the regulatory stay. In other words, where patent validity is not finally settled through further appeals, can a drug authority end the regulatory stay and go ahead and approve the drug? Now, an emerging consensus has been that the answer will be yes. But at the same time, for the generics, they have been given the first to market exclusivity, and that has been stipulated to be a 12 month period. So that's quite significant incentive given to generics. But for innovators, there is the so-called patent damages claim based on bad faith assertion. And that is a claim that can be exploited by a generic company and could be potentially used as further leverage by generic. So now we can draw the conclusion. There are structurally and fundamental difference between the US system and the China system. That's certainly true that China, to some extent, has modeled of the Hatch-Waxman system, but there are certain features, 
from the Korean and Canadian patent linkage systems that have been borrowed and incorporated in the system we are having now. At the broadest level, I would say that in the United States, there are 30 years of hatch waxman litigation, and there are detailed and very, very nuanced rules. But in China, the rules are intentionally to be left at a very high level, and there are ambiguities and uncertainties. So indeed, the patent linkage rules issued by the CNIPA and NMPA have been said to be rules for a trial period. So the authorities in China are taking the approach of crossing the river by feeling the stone. This may be a Chinese idiom you've heard before. So for sure, there are challenges ahead. First and foremost, given the uncertainties and the ambiguities, it's almost very, very difficult to forecast and also to plan for generic entry in China. So this is very, very little predictability. And the nine month stay period, would that be even sufficient for either CNIPA or Spain IP court to issue a decision? And how about the interplay between patent invalidation proceedings and scope confirmation proceeding, which is the big debate I mentioned earlier. Notwithstanding the challenges, I think it would be worthwhile for innovator companies from the States and other parts of the world to now better understand the generic entry patterns we've seen and observed on the ground in China, because that probably will help you better grasp the system in China. There are actually two types of generic entries. One is the type of conventional entry, which you are probably very familiar with. That is, generic will only seek to enter into the market around the time of patent expiration. That's the most cost-effective strategy for them, right? But now in China, because of the cost for patent invalidation is not as high, in recent years, we've seen early and aggressive entry by the generics. This means that a generic company, company may seek to in, invalidate an innovator's patent, including their compound patent, two or three years after innovators received marketing authorization. An extreme case we have here in point is for Novartis and Trusto drug. Uh, you probably wouldn't believe it. The patent was subject to invalidation challenge even before the grant of the marketing authorization by the NMPA. So to better prepare for patent linkage litigation in China, it will be critically important for you to gauge the intelligence from the Chinese market and also to assess the likelihood of early and aggressive generic entry. For that, you of course will need to closely monitor generic filings and certifications. And you will also need to prepare actions early, get your POA and notarized and legalized documents ready, because in China, we have very stringent formality requirements to file an action. But at the same time, you will need to fully assess your case, be cognizant of the potential damages claim against an innovator's bad faith assertion. Once you are facing a patent challenge by a, a generic company, well, all you need to do is to fight ruthlessly to defend validity of your patent. But I think at broad level, we need to be done, I think for the broader patent community is to lobby for clarity, consistency, and predictability of this new patent linkage system because CNIP officials have also recognized in informal meetings, this has been perceived as a working progress. So uh, we'll be continuing to monitor developments in China and things will be getting perhaps more and more interesting. Uh, I'm conscious of the time, so I'll just stop here and to discuss a few further slides, hopefully in our Q&A session. Thanks, Elaine. Thank you very much, Jill. Uh, and we will have our last speaker, last but not least, Lynn Sonhoffen. Thank you. Oh, hi. Uh, thank you, Elaine, for the invitation to talk. Um, 
different from uh, previous two speakers, Joe and uh, Jonathan. I'm a, a U.S. patent lawyer, licensed patent lawyer. So I'm going to talk more uh, on the U.S. perspectives uh, on the licensing side. So um, as, a, as everyone know, you have all these patents, right? What's the patent for? And patent you need to commercialize or to make the uh, monetize with this um, uh, whatever you invent. So when I was practicing for many years as a patent lawyer, and later on, my team and us, we, uh, our firm, we started getting into a lot of uh, license agreement, uh, review and drafting. We found out it's actually these two are very important link, link together. Uh, when you do a patent, you know, you need to know what's the value there. And, and through the licensing, we understand, you know, where different patents have different value, and it's very important. So, uh, as we, we know, you get exclusive right of in, in, the, in the license. What does the license mean? Here, we, we, we can say, you know, you, you license, you give other people the right to use um, your patent, exclusive right or non-exclusive right. So, this is just a... Um, kind of brief introduction of what the license is, it's a contract. Um, and usually in the license agreement, in the IP license agreement, you have, you know, the clause, what, what you grant, you grant exclusive, non-exclusive, uh, what you use in the, um, so when I doing the, when I, when we work on the cross borders with China and the US, uh, we realize, I mean, the comparison is, a lot of Chinese companies doing the exclusive license from US. They want the drug uh, compound type of license. Um, then the field restrictions. So we, we've seen all different kinds of field people um, try to get some all fields or majority also get the cancer related field in, uh, from China to, uh, from US to China. Um, duration of the grant, of course, the patent term is very important in this one. So Previous speaker also has at a different degree talk about the patent terms uh, when you have the duration of the grant of your license. And uh, another thing is uh, geographic restriction where the territory you have. And of course, uh, many of my clients um, to try to license from uh, US, they want the China or greater China right versus US, uh, our US client who license from China, they would get most of the right except for greater China. So it's a, I've seen this, this, this kind of trend these, today, these days. And the, um, again, the, the other one is a financial, really important. You know, these, the financial terms usually discussed very early in the term sheet. You know, you talk about how much money, because that try to save time. If you, you couldn't agree with the financial term, then, you know, it's not worthwhile to spend a lot of money to do the uh, agreement because it's a long agreement and takes a lot of time. And we've seen uh, the trend on the, on the fee is like, if you go to the, a lot of Chinese clients are these days trying to license their, uh, trying to get a um, license from the US universities. And those upfront fee is kind of relative low. So uh, they go, they ch and take this um, asset and they want to use apply for grant or apply for a fund from the investor. So that's a, a trend we've seen uh, quite often. Um, when they try to license in the US company, they rather to pay and try to find the asset more like in the later stage. And then in this case, they pay a lot of higher uh, upfront fee. Um, and we, during the negotiation, a lot of time the people talk about sub-licensing. Um, in China, you, you, um, in US, when you uh, license, you say, hey, sub-license, that's pretty easy uh, to disclose, to uh, control the sub-licensees. In China, sub-licensees are very difficult to control. So in the negotiation, they will talk a lot, of, they will negotiate with you how, less, uh, how much they can control the sub -licensee. So. Um, We've seen this um, um, during the negotiation that the, sub, uh, the, the, the licensee, they say, we cannot give you sub licensees information because in China, they, those sub licensees, they wouldn't give us information. And also we can have less control over them. So these kind of term for the US side, we have to understand that to, to, to be aware of that. Um, 
And the another important thing, you know, in the uh, license is the due diligence. Um, I found out in um, in the uh, Chinese company when they come to US to license uh, a technology, they look at the people, they look at the company's name. They tend to do less about due diligence of the IP. And then later on, when there's a problem, they say, oh, there's all the problem in there. So for a US entity, it's better to talk to earlier to them, say, here is our IP and disclose uh, er, more instead of later on when the other party come to you, say, hey, I didn't see this. Uh, that happens quite <laughs> quite often. So that's, that company had to be aware. And for the universities, um, that's pretty easy for a Chinese entity to look at it because it's, um, it's most in the publication and it's um, pretty open in, in, you know, if it's in the patent. But the company wise, there's a lot of um, know-how stuff need to, uh, you guys too had to talk about two sides. So uh, what we need to be aware when you license your uh, stuff out uh, to a Chinese entity, you really have to consider the export control issue. Um, although it's, uh, you know, since the uh, CFIUS, the, the, uh, there's a big drop of Chinese investor in US companies. However, there's increase, a lot of increase of license um, from US to China because uh, the Chinese company, Chinese investor will invest more in the technology in, in the location in China. The, so they, 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 uh, there's no uh, CFIUS review for the, per se, for the um, license issue yet, but you have to con consider export control, especially for the genetic uh, information. Same issue for China too. If you want to license Chinese technology to US, you have to really watch about this genetic information because China has very strict, uh, it's in even the criminal um, punishment if they improperly transfer the genetic information uh, into foreign countries. And also, again, uh, very common in the agreement, you review what's the um, law governing. Um, you know, the Chinese contract, if you work with China, the Chinese contract is very simple usually, versus the US contract is very long and what law to use. And so many times the compromise either use Hong Kong law or use um, Singapore law. Uh, that's, uh, that's kind of like a mut uh, mutually agreed, but you have to be aware of the change in here. And uh, um, one really important part in the license in my experience is the definitions you have to make earlier. Although you say that in the term sheet, people are more focused on the uh, they're more focusing on the financial term. It's uh, the earlier you define those, those licensed product IP, what you know how, the better for you. Because uh, in addition to a patent, know how uh, comprise a lot of the IP in there. Um, many times we found out that um, the US company wants more information. The Chinese company say, oh, I only give you this, this little. They didn't talk about in the uh, term sheet time. They, they found out in the uh, licensing, I mean, the agreement time, then it's more extensive negotiation. And the other thing on the IP uh, improvement part, um, many times people license your technology, they improve and they, they try to uh, ditch your name, just put their own IP and they, they use this as their own patent filing. So that part you have to understand, you, uh, you have to be aware. And some university, they have like a, a reach out clause saying, uh, we want anything in, enabled by our patent. It's our, also our patent. So uh, this way you kind of control how far uh, you can get to your patent. That's another negotiation process. And uh, uh, the, the term has a lot of like how much data you can use, how much tech, uh, technology transfer you can get. And the more you detail, uh, the more detailed, the better it is. But I've seen the discrepancy between two sides, and especially uh, the Ch Chinese sides usually they expect more, but they didn't understand in the early negotiation, didn't put more in, uh, in the agreement. Later on, they require, uh, require more. So that's something you have to be aware. And again, in the license agreement, uh, you know, the due diligence part, you have to look at ownership, or you, you also have to discuss about not joint ownership, 
and for the joint invention, when you, you need to be aware what you need to get uh, the license and who pays for the patent cost. Um, the last slide, it's very simple, is what you need to, uh, as a licensor, uh, usually from the U.S. side, you make sure your, uh, uh, your licensee is not going to compete with you. And, and also, you have to make sure what you reserve your rights. Um, sometimes um, people don't, it's, it's a lot of uh, vague thing in the, in the early stages. So the more you talk about in the term sheet, the better it is what you want to reserve and uh, um, make sure there's no challenge uh, to the patent. So these are the, just like a general um, review of the license issue for your IP. So we can, um, I, I'll talk more during the discussion in terms of uh, concern about time. Thank you here. Thank you very much. I want to thank uh, all our excellent speakers for the very comprehensive presentations. Uh, they were excellent. Um, and I want to remind everybody again that if you do have questions uh, for the speakers, please email them to askchinaip at uspto.gov. Again, askchinaip at uspto.gov. We'll have a Q&A period after our discussion. So. I wanted to uh, go ahead and, and uh, have a discussion to kind of pull out some of the, the things that uh, each of the speakers talked about uh, and, and perhaps uh, generate kind of a discussion, maybe have, uh, maybe that will also generate some questions from the audience. So I want to go ahead and, and start with uh, Jill, uh, who uh, gave an excellent presentation on patent linkage. Jill, um, you know, you, you do have in your presentation uh, uh, a slide on the main differences between the two patent linkage systems in China and the U.S., and you mentioned some of the various aspects. I wanted to ask you about the administrative and judicial routes of the patent linkage system in China. I understand that the patentee must pick one route. I, I hope my understanding is correct. Uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages of the administrative and the judicial routes? And how would you advise clients as to which route to choose? Thanks, Yiling. I think this is an excellent question. Uh, first of all, there are pros and cons that need to be weighed uh, in each specific case to optimize your position, litigation position vis-a-vis -vis the other side. So perhaps we can take a look at the administrative action. Uh, apparently, that the single biggest advantage I would think is that a favorable ruling from the CNIPA as to scope confirmation we talked about earlier will halt the regulatory approval. And the average time for CNIPA to adjudicate and dispose a case is around six months. So this means that within the nine nine months of regulatory stay, it is doable if you can achieve a favorable result. As to the second option, which is the judicial action, the Beijing IP court is a very established and probably the most experienced IP court in China with vast and wealth of experience with, and with experts in every aspect of IP and patent law. Uh, the Supreme Court purposefully included a provision and on preliminary injunction, which is not available before the CNIPA, if one only uses the, the administrative route. And the current preliminary injunction practice, as Jonathan mentioned earlier, is that when validity is in doubt, it will be impossible to obtain a preliminary injunction. But theoretically, the procedural flexibility before the Beijing IP court, I think is a potential consideration that we need to be taken into account. And naturally, the question is, from an optionality point of view, what will be worthwhile initiating action at both forums to preserve flex procedural flexibility? And this is possible if you go to the CNI IPA first and then go to the Beijing IP court. It is now under the rule possible to do that, but other way around is not possible. You cannot go to Beijing IP court first and then trying to do the case again before the CNIPA. So that's where things stand now. And according to the statistics, 
currently the majority users of the patent linkage system have opted for the administrative route. So CNIPA have reported that they have taken on more than 20 cases, and there's only one reported case that has been filed with the Beijing IP court. So Elaine, it's a long answer to respond to your question. Great, thank you, Jill. That's very interesting. Only one case filed with the the Beijing IP court. I'm kind of curious if this is a, a foreign or domestic case. Uh, but anyway, thank you. Yeah. It's a foreign case. It's a foreign case. Okay, interesting. All right. Uh, thanks for that, Jill. Uh, I, I want to turn over to Jonathan uh, next. Um, Jonathan, uh, many foreign companies uh, are now aware that the judicial process uh, in China has limited means of discovery, and you, you mentioned that as well. That's one of the big differences between the U.S. and Chinese system. What are some strategies you suggest to foreign companies to help overcome this obstacle, particularly you know, U.S. companies that are, uh, you know, very uh, accustomed to much more discovery than is available in the Chinese system. Yeah. So as I mentioned, uh, in China, we don't have the discovery process. The basic principle, uh, the basic rule of evidence is uh, the one who assert bear the burden of proof to, to show evidence. So that's the basic principle. So uh, since uh, there is a, such a difference between the U.S. practice and the China practice, so for U.S. clients, my suggestion is, uh, firstly, you need to fix your evidence in a timely manner. For example, if you see the infringer is offering your product on a website, then you usually instruct your lawyer to fix that evidence by uh, inviting a notary public to fix that evidence. Uh, and uh, use notarization or like a time step to to fix your evidence. And uh, th th that's the first uh, suggestion. The second uh, the second one is uh, to proactively use the the mirrors, the assisting mirrors uh, provided by by the courts, like uh, evidence uh, investigation order or evidence production order. As mentioned in my uh, example cases. In that case, uh, we we request uh, the judge to issue evidence of production order. So uh, if the infringer refuses to pr produce the evidence of production order, the judge may rely on our evidence to, to give a much higher uh, compensation award. So in that case, the, the, the infringer will be forced to produce their financial books and the sales contract. Yeah. So that's my answer, Amy. Thank you. Great. Okay. Um, that that's that's useful. Thank you, uh, Lynn. Uh, over to you. Um, you know, I know that you you had mentioned that you have handled number of biopharma licensing transactions, uh, uh, including Chinese companies licensing technologies from U.S. Uh, from U.S. companies and the other way around. I wanted to know uh, from you, what are some of the more unique aspects of such licensing agreements that you think are particularly important for foreign companies to know? And in addition to that, uh, in particular, it'd be interesting to know some of the more common pitfalls from a U.S. company perspective uh, and how to, you know, how would you suggest avoiding those pitfalls? Okay, uh, thank you. Um, for me, I think from the RD6 event, the IP due diligence is very important. Um, when they, um, I found out that in during the um, transactions, um, the, ch the Chinese company, they usually just say, okay, because Harvard is famous, I'm just going to go to this famous professor, get it. And when they look at the patent stuff, they didn't really look at what claimed in campus and not carefully reviewing what they need. That's a, that's a skip. I don't, I kept telling them, don't skip that step. It's important to know what you get. And for the US company, I also noticed that when they license, they thought they licensed something more. Uh, but in Chinese side, they only say, oh, only give them a piece of a sequence. We don't give them all the data, but that has to be really negotiated, talked earlier, say, know-how is important. I want more know-how than I need. And the communication, I see that was lacking that in that part, but it's uh, it's like a growing thing, and what you get, what you're not getting, it, even though there's agreement, sometimes 
that the mind does not meet. So it's a it's a contract issue. They need to talk talk more. In line, may I jump in here a bit from a dispute point of view? And I think yes, for this please. type of uh, licensing deals, we've seen foreign companies typically wanting to use, say, Delaware court or court in California. But, you know, for this type of cross-border transactions, enforcing a foreign judgment from the U.S. now is still being near impossible. Uh, there are precedents, precedents, but there's no precedent in the context of licensing deals. So opting for arbitration, and given that China is a member of the New York Convention, I think will be much desired option in terms of dispute resolution costs. We've seen that a lot, so, so quickly to jump in on that. Yeah, that, thank you for that. That is something that I think we, we need to remind ourselves uh, about arbitration, not something that we discuss so much here in the US, but I think that's a really important point. Thank you for bringing that up, uh, Jill, because I know that that's an important Avenue uh, in China as well. Uh, yeah, the other thing, as uh, yeah. I forgot to mention, is they also need to understand the political environment, especially the U.S. Uh, um, U.S. laws, the CFIUS law, uh, and the, and export control. They keep adding different lists. Now, Wuxi Farmer is on one of the lists. So all these things, they have to be aware what's going on. Right. Exactly. Thank you. Um. Let's move over to Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan, you, you touched this briefly in your presentation about the issue of supplemental data, certainly uh, a longstanding issue for uh, U.S. and foreign biopharma companies uh, in China. Can you explain uh, the issue a little bit more? And uh, you had mentioned that uh, it seems that the issue perhaps has been addressed and wanted to know a little bit more about how exactly it's been addressed and in your experience or experience of others, has it been addressed in a, in a hopefully satisfactory manner for, for foreign companies? Yeah, so yes, this is indeed a longstanding issue and also a hot issue for, for players in the biopharma field. Uh, and uh, I, I would like to say, after the phase one uh, uh, treaty between China and the U.S., we have seen a steady improvement uh, towarding the, the direction prescribed uh, in the phase one agreement, uh, not only in the substantive examination stage, but also in the invalidation procedure and in the court procedure. We all see a more lenient attitude toward uh, uh, and a more friendly attitude toward post filing data. That's indeed the truth. Uh, but as to the criteria for the acceptance of uh, post filing data, I mean, the substantive examination, uh, I would like to say. Uh, there is not so 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 huge difference. Uh, there is still uh, some difference between China and U.S. practice. Uh, so uh, I think the Chinese examiner uh, they still hold that uh, the basis of for for the for the patent system is uh, disclosure for for protection, and based on that they they have a still strict requirement that uh, the post filing data or the fact to be proved by the post filing data should be clearly and specifically disclosed uh, in the written description. Uh, and uh, based on that criteria, if uh, the client want to file some post filing data to prove uh, some technical effect, which is not actually uh, uh, recorded in the written description, uh, for, for that kind of situation, it is still not acceptable in China. So in short, I mean, uh, in general, we are having more lenient and friendly attitude to post filing data, but uh, 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 the, we need to see the progress step by step. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Let's let's go back to Jill. Um, another question about. Uh, the patent linkage system. This is one about biologics. Um, uh, are the are the listable patents for biologics only limited to sequential structure? So, 
you know, what if I have a patent for, uh, say, cellular extract or something that is not a sequential structure? Am I out of luck to utilize the new patent linkage system? Can you tell me or explain that to me? Thanks. Sure. Uh, thanks, Elaine. So right now, the patent linkage system, I mean, the patent linkage litigation system is only limited to chemical drugs. So biologics, a large wouldn't be able to avail of the patent linkage system. Although Article 76 of patent law in itself is not limited to chemical drugs. And what is happening right now will be that a biologic companies will be able to submit patent listings and they can list sequential structure, but can only do that. And as I mentioned in my presentation, China is right now only intending for the system to be an experiment. So in future, there will be new rules and hopefully biologics will be covered and will not be only limited to sequential structure only. But we will need to um, have some time to see how things unfold. Okay, thank you. So it's wait and see. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right, um, going back to Lynn uh, about licensing trends, uh, just just looking into the next few years, what licensing trends do you see that may be important for a U.S. company to know from your experience, what you've seen so far? Yeah, as I mentioned earlier that um, the investment trend is dropping, um, the licensing trend is increasing from China to in license US technology to improve their own uh, portfolio. Um, there are like I have many, many friends, they move back to China, they start a company. So I will see more and more in license, what do we call it, from, from US, that especially from early uh, US early technology for the startup company like university technology, more and more like that. Also from China, there will be more, uh, they, some company want the late stage asset the 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 company was which has equipped with a lot of funding they were in license more late stage uh asset from us for the china rights however because uh most of company uh, you know a lot of ipo company in china their their value is cut into half those company need more money and there are there will be some good asset from china to our license to the us company and they would out license more like a worldwide except for, uh, except for X greater China, right? So you will get probably more uh, good yield for the US company to look for in Chinese asset too. That's, I think that's the trend. Mm. Okay, interesting. Um, okay, okay, good. Uh, Jill, over to you. Um, this is a question about uh, uh, patent term extension. Uh, and I understand that patent term extension in the draft patent law implementing regulations is only limited to certain classes of improved drugs, uh, um, it, 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 particularly in the draft patent examination guidelines issued last year. Does it mean that improved drugs outside those listed are not getting patent term extension? Is this something you can address? Right. So we are all still waiting and trying to see what will be uh, coming out of the final patent examination guidelines to be issued by CNIPA. Hopefully this will be out within the next few months. But until that, I, I don't have a clear answer to the question, but you are right. According to the draft examination guidelines, only certain improvements will be eligible for patent term extension. But I think we should take a step back and. There are also a few things I think uh, companies should bear in mind. According to the drug examination guidelines, only new drug uh, that has not been marketed anywhere in the world will be eligible for patent term extension. And that concept new drug um, actually is not consistent with the new drug definition and the PRC drug administration law. So this is also something practitioners within the patent community have been debating a lot and trying to grapple with. But hopefully, um, given the pushback from the industry, I think not only from 
foreign companies, but also from domestic companies. Uh, China has increasingly become the world's innovation hub for life sciences. Hopefully, there will be better certainty and clarity from CNIPA when they issue the final uh, examination guidelines. Okay, thanks, Jill. So this is another wait and see. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, I wanted to see if there are any questions from the audience. Uh, we have some more questions to ask of the speakers, but I wanted to give the opportunity uh, to the audience to see if there's any questions. Larry, I know you've been looking at uh, questions. Are there any things that uh, from the audience that? Yeah, uh, we actually have uh, quite a few that uh, came in through the Ask China IP uh, email address. Let me just, uh, uh, I kind of sorted them a little bit. The first question I think could go to probably all three speakers. Can you ask the panel uh, the need to have a Chinese company as a partner if a U.S. company plans to commercialize a product in China? In the past, uh, the best practice has also has uh, indicated there was, there was a need to have a Chinese-based company to address local policy, local politics, and practice, uh, also to infer, uh, ensure fair treatment before the courts. And what uh, what is the uh, I guess for all three panelists, what's your take? On the question, just from uh, I, I can start from licensing part, and that's what happened to a lot of companies. They license their good asset to a Chinese company like uh, Z Lab, Beijing. They also license in license the big Chinese farmer. Actually, they originally licensed in license a lot of tech, and they helped them to promote their own drugs in in China. I think that's a good model. At this time, that's my. Yeah, I think what we've observed on the ground is that because of the huge patient population in China, a lot of multinationals are try also trying to take advantage of clinical trials in China. But as Lin mentioned, in China we have this human genetic data regime, meaning that if you are trying to get clinical data out of China, you need to go through certain administrative approval process. And because of that regime place, and because of the ongoing geopolitical tensions, I would tend to believe that it would still be a best practice to work with a PRC partner. But how you can diligence that partner and ensure you have safeguards in place to ensure a smooth collaboration and to get clinical data out of China, I think will be something that require not contractual provisions to protect you but as well as ongoing operational vigilance throughout the collaboration. Yes, uh, so from time to time, I'm also uh, confronted with uh, this kind of a question from our foreign clients uh, about the political in, uh, impact uh, on the outcome of a patent infringement litigation. So from my personal experience, I think, uh, uh, that's not so significant because, uh, especially in the patent infringement litigation. So in our cases, uh, we are we are asserting uh, our uh, assertions by using evidence. So so long as we have evidence to show we have fixed the, in, the infringing products, we have our test report, and the result shows there is an infringement, at least you can get injunction order. As to the monitor compensation, uh, uh, I at least in my case, I didn't see such a political influence. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, the, uh, another question is kind of maybe related with the first question. The question asked, uh, can you elaborate uh, on a licensee trying to improve a patent and then ditch the, uh, ditching the uh, patent owner? Are there any case studies, uh, either domestic or foreign? And what would you advise the patent owner to uh, preempt such an attempt by a licensee to uh, ditch the uh, patent owner? Uh, I probably can, I can take this uh, question it happens quite a bit. Uh, and not happens quite in people's mind. They, you know, as a licensee, they want to take this license over. Then they improve a little bit. They ditch the license sore, so they can they avoid by paying by avoid paying maintenance fee and royalty whatever downstream. And then they become their own um, the new IP become their own IP. And the 
as a licensor, it's really important to put some language saying anything related, and you have to be more specific, you know, just like the university, the big university, anything enabled by our technology, that's our IP. You insist on that. And that's very important uh, to avoid them to get you or, and also you need to uh, make sure the language, if they have anything new, you need to get a, a free license too uh, for you to use. Um, it, it, yeah, it's been negotiated back and forth. I've, I've been representing both sides. But uh, the side, if you, you have upper hand, you insist on anything enabled by my technology. You need to, uh, that I need to have a share or I need to be the um, owner. Maybe that's too much, but you can at least get some share out of that. I also wanted to add a, a few points here. I fully agree with Lane. Uh, I think I had a case where I had a licensee using our client's know-how and filed more than 100 patents in China. That's an extreme case, but it speaks for the importance of protecting your know-how and how you can uh, include as much as contractual protection as you can think of. So restrictive covenants in agreement will be critically important. And I think it's also important to have an audit clause so that you can invoke the relevant clause if some situation is not going right. But again, there requires certain level of vigilance how you can properly monitor potential filings made by a licensee or having any local intelligence from employees in China. I think this is uh, something um, a lot of companies are, are facing, um, but, but contractual protection is the first line of defense for you. Have a proper contract in case. Okay, thank you. The next question uh, is with regard to uh, Article 14 of the uh, of China's patent law. I actually quickly looked at Article 14. I, I think it may uh, the uh, audience, sorry, I didn't catch the name here, I may have misread Article 14, but let me just read the question to you. I think there may be two sort of two aspects that we can separately uh, address. So the uh, audience question is Article 14 of China's patent law allows Chinese central government to permit designated units to uh, exploit important invention uh, important invention so long as the uh, exploitation fee is paid to the patent holder. Essentially, Article 14 allows an open licensing system. What are possible paths for a patent holder uh, that, that a patent holder can take to avoid unwanted companies obtaining a license uh, to the uh, patentee's IP uh, in situations such as Article 14? And let me explain why. Uh, I think the uh, Article 14 actually may be may not uh, be about a pan, uh, open license. I quickly looked at Article 14. It actually, uh, it's about a invention patent uh, by a state-owned enterprise. If that's of uh, great significance, the government can. Uh, uh, it's kind of like the U.S. Martin rights. So, but I think the audience question is still. Valid. So, sort of a two aspects. Number one is the state-owned enterprise uh, produced patent. The government can kind of uh, take uh, can march in if it's important. And the open licensing system. I forgot which article. It's sort of a separate article in the uh, patent law. And uh, let me maybe take a first uh, stab at the question. I think the open licensing system is totally voluntary, right? So, if you don't want your patent to be uh, to be listed as open license as uh, listed as available to open license, uh, you don't have to. But once you list your patent in that open licensing system, and uh, this is a question for all three of you, I don't think you can then say, oh, I want I can uh, 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 I I don't think you can say to potential licensee, oh, I want a license to you, but not the other licensee. Open licensing system means anybody can license, right? Uh, and you actually list out the terms and the uh, fees, right? Am I right? Uh, yes, I think you're right, Larry. So the open license regime is uh, is newly introduced into the Chinese patent law in the fourth amendment to the Chinese patent law. 
uh, and uh, it's a voluntary. It's a voluntarily. It's a not something you are forced to 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 allow open license of your patents. Uh, but you have also once you uh, the the CNIP even after the CNIPA announced that this is an open license the patent you can withdraw. You can withdraw your application application for 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 open license. So uh, so once you announce your patent is an open license the patent you you need to follow uh, a rule similar to the to the friend uh, friend, agree oh, friend agreement. The, the uh, friend. Set, uh, yeah. That patents type yeah. of rules. Okay, yeah, that's yeah. no 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 discrimination. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, just kind of uh, what's the best term to describe? Just playing devil's advocate. I actually a question just occurred to me uh, related to the audience question. If you really don't want to license your patent to uh, to a company, let's say you put it in the open license system, then all of a sudden this uh, company approached you. Can you then say, oh, I want to withdraw? <laughs> uh no at that time no? you cannot withdraw. Okay, okay. Yeah, no yeah because the other party has uh from the has already trust, approached you kind of a trust yeah already oh, approached okay. you yeah okay uh, so the actually uh in the open license regime the cnipa they they play the role of a uh, kind of a platform actually okay uh, the cnipa they have a, a great concern that they may have a kind of responsibility in uh, publishing and announcing the relevant information they don't want to take any liability uh, in this regime they are only working as a platform they okay. providing uh, open license information for for the users. The users they these they they looking for those uh, information on the platform. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And going back to the first part of the audience question regarding Article Fourteen, you mentioned made by state owned company. Uh, the the government has a right to uh, license. I guess to for, uh, forcefully license that pen as long as there's reasonable compensation. I read it as very similar to the uh, sort of marching rights in the uh, United States. Uh, do three of you have any uh, have any experience, experience, or actually, are you aware of any marching, quote unquote, marching rights exercised by the government yet? No, I don't think there is a precedent case. Yeah. Okay. No, no case, no precedent case, and also this is a uh, an article. Uh, uh, specifically for state-owned company, it has nothing to do with a foreign company. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you. Right. I think this is another wait and see. We'll see how the rules will be deployed at some point. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you. So um, we we are actually uh, at a, a little over time. So we uh, this goes to this webinar goes to eleven o'clock. Uh, so we are over time. So I want to thank again uh, all our speakers uh, for excellent presentations, for uh, I think a, a hopefully a useful Q&A period uh, for everyone. I think this was a very interesting. I've learned a couple of new things. So again, appreciate this very much and thank you all. And uh, a reminder to the audience, uh, please go ahead and take the post uh, uh, webinar survey so that we can continually help to improve these webinars uh, and uh, get you the best information we can. Thank you again oh, very sorry, much. Oh, sorry, uh, sorry, Elaine. I actually forgot yeah. to answer an important question. Several people asked about the uh, slides. I want to uh, quickly mention this uh, event is actually recorded. Uh, I think two to right. three weeks. Once we go through some uh, some steps, it will be available on a PTO website, and also the uh, slides uh, pending. Uh, uh, speaker permission will be uh, all posted as well. And, yes. and uh, uh, with just one last thing, actually two or three or even four questions came in that uh, we're gonna, not going to have time to address. It all relates to the uh, to CFIUS and the uh, newer version of CC, uh, CFIUS is, uh, I think it's called FIRMA. Yes. Uh, maybe, uh, I'm not sure how much uh, ex uh, experience Lin has uh, with regard to both, but uh, maybe we can address those questions through email by Lynn or something. We kind of run out of time this time. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I can. Okay, great. We can talk about this later. Yeah, that's a, that's a long story, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you all very much. Okay. Thank you, thank you everybody. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. Bye. 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 B